This is Malik Cook from the University of Colorado, and the topic today is cataract surgery as an IOP lowering procedure. Let's start off with a case presentation. This is a 62-year-old male with 12-year history of primary open-angle glaucoma treated bilaterally with latanoprost and dorzolamide. IOP is 18 in the right eye, 16 in the left eye, with the goal of 16 in both eyes. Visual field deficit is stable over the last three to four years. The patient has a visually significant cataract in both eyes with angles now open to the posterior trabecular meshwork. He admits that he forgets to use dorzolamide a few times per week despite repeated educational sessions. And the question is, what is your next step? We'll come back to this case later. MIGS has been getting all the buzz in glaucoma surgery. This is defined as any surgical manipulation or device implantation, typically combined with cataract extraction through a self-sealing incision with minimal trauma to surrounding tissues and results in a measurable sustained decrease in IOP. If I had a MIGS wish list, it would include the following. It would be as effective as trabeculectomy with better safety, reproducible and predictable, I would like to avoid a bleb for all of the complications that can occur with a bleb, as you see in the Seidel positive picture on the right-hand side. It would be great if the procedure were straightforward to perform, less post-operative effort, and also cost-effective. If you look at that list and you think of cataract extraction, I think cataract extraction might be the best MIGs that we have available. We use a small cornea-based incision, excellent safety profile, proven sustained IOP lowering, and all options remain for future interventions. Certainly a paradigm shift is occurring in the way that we treat glaucoma surgically. In the past, we typically swung for the fences, looking for high IOP lowering, despite the increased risk from an adverse event profile. But sometimes low risk with less IOP lowering is the better choice. And in this case, you can see on the bottom left-hand side that the mix category is heavily influenced by combining cataract surgery with the procedure. In fact, with the eye stand, much of the IOP lowering that is occurring comes from the cataract surgery itself. This is not unusual for other MIGS devices, both implantable and non-implantable procedures that are done in the angle. The science of IOP lowering after cataract surgery has been heavily investigated over the years. In the case of open angles, the level of IOP lowering after cataract surgery is likely due in some part to remodeling of the extracellular matrix of the trabecular meshwork. This might be similar to laser trabeculoplasty. We routinely see significant and persistent IOP lowering even when preoperative angles are wide open. This is a study that was performed by Joel Schumann and his colleagues looking at the effects of ultrasound on the levels of various cytokines in the environment of the trabecular meshwork. What they found was exposing trabecular meshwork in both healthy and glaucomatous eyes increased the level of some cytokines, specifically E-selectin which could then remodel the trabecular meshwork and lead to a decrease in intraocular pressure. The science of IOP lowering after cataract surgery also applies to narrow angles. The level of IOP lowering after cataract surgery is proportional to the resultant widening of the angle. Anterior vault may be predictive of IOP lowering. Gonioscopy and anterior segment OCT have been utilized to study these aspects and angle morphology, as well as characteristics of the iris and the lens vault have all been linked to decreases in intraocular pressure after cataract surgery. We know that cataract surgery is not very effective in chronic angle closure due to the peripheral anterior synechia. And this is one case where combining cataract surgery with goniosynechia lysis or other angle procedures might be the better route. One pearl for practice, when you're placing an LPI on a patient who is bound to have cataract surgery in the near future, the laser should be applied temporally beneath the area where the clear corneal wound will be placed. This will decrease the chance of iris prolapse into the corneal wound during the cataract surgery. Extracellular matrix remodeling and change in angle configuration are both relevant to the mechanism of IOP lowering post-cataract surgery. Studies are underway with advanced imaging, as well as protein sampling, to better understand the processes involved. We do have the advantage of multiple clinical trials to guide the way we care for patients who have narrow angles, including acute angle closure. For example, we know that phaco emulsification is a great option from Lam and colleagues who looked at 31 eyes with acute angle closure and cataract who then underwent FACO, highlighted by comparisons to previous studies looking at the use of LPI in this situation. And what they found was FACO had lower IOP, less medications, and better visual acuity. The EAGLE trial has also been very informative in these cases. 
In the EAGLE trial, they looked at the best approach to treating primary angle closure or primary angle closure glaucoma with standard of care versus clear lens extraction. In this case, the patients had an age greater than 50 and IOP of 30 millimeters of mercury or higher or primary angle closure glaucoma. They looked at 419 patients, 155 in the primary angle closure group and 263 in the primary angle closure glaucoma group. 208 were assigned to clear lens extraction and 211 to standard of care. In this case, standard of care was LPI. IOP was 1.18 millimeters of mercury lower in the clear lens extraction group versus the standard of care group. And their conclusion was that clear lens extraction showed greater efficacy and was more cost effective than standard of care with LPI and should be considered as first line therapy. In the case of chronic angle closure, Tam and colleagues performed an RCT of phaco emulsification versus phaco trabeculectomy. In 2008, in medically controlled chronic angle closure glaucoma, they found no difference in IOP after three months, and the phaco trab group was on less medications but had more complications. In 2009, with medically uncontrolled chronic angle closure glaucoma, phaco emulsification alone lowered IOP by 8 millimeters of mercury. In the phaco trab group, lower mean IOP at 18 months, 13.6 versus 15.9, with a mean of 1.25 less post op medications but more complications and progression of optic neuropathy. It is of note that in the FACO alone group mentioned above, 16 of the 35 eyes required posterior sneakyolysis or pupil stretching intraoperatively. In this study of 35 patients in the FACO group and 44 patients in the FACO trabeculectomy group, they found a mean IOP decrease of 20.7 and 29.5 from before surgery to five years after FACO and FACO trabeculectomy respectively. FACO trabeculectomy was significantly more effective than FACO in reducing IOP up to five years after surgery. Vision in the FACO group was slightly better at five years versus FACO trabeculectomy. In this study by Mansberger and colleagues, the focus was specifically on the observation group of the ocular hypertension treatment study. 42 participants, 63 eyes, underwent cataract surgery in at least one eye during the study, and there was a control group of 743 participants, 743 eyes, who did not undergo cataract surgery. They defined the split date as the study visit date that cataract surgery was reported in, the cataract surgery group, and a corresponding date in the control group. Preoperative IOP was defined as the mean IOP of up to three visits prior to the split date. The estimated mean decrease in IOP postoperatively in the cataract surgery group was four millimeters of mercury. The control group had a slight mean decrease in IOP of 0.3 millimeters of mercury. And you can see here at zero, which is the split date, a significant decrease in IOP in the cataract surgery group that was sustained for at least 36 months. Of note here, the percentage of eyes that had a significant decrease in IOP, 20 to 29%, or over 30%, was almost 40% of the patients. But it is also important to note that 11.1% of patients had an increase compared to their preoperative IOP, although in the majority of cases, this was only a slight increase. Poli and colleagues looked at the long-term effects of phaco emulsification with intraocular lens implantation in normotensive and ocular hypertensive eyes. And in summary, what they found was a significant decrease in IOP that was sustained and also related to the level of baseline pressure. The higher the pressure, the more significant the decrease in IOP after phaco emulsification. The same group looked at intraocular pressure reduction after phaco emulsification with intraocular lens implantation in glaucomatous versus non-glaucomatous eyes. And they found essentially the same thing. The higher the preoperative pressure, the more drop in intraocular pressure, which was sustained over a long period of time. The mean number of glaucoma drops was 1.3 before surgery and 1 at the final measurement. Essentially, this group found that phaco emulsification resulted in a decrease in intraocular pressure in normotensive eyes as well as glaucoma eyes related to the baseline intraocular pressure level and sustained over a long period of time. It seems that cataract surgery would be an awful control group when studying the efficacy of glaucoma procedures combined with cataract surgery. We do have many MIGS trials that inform us on the efficacy of cataract surgery in glaucoma patients. Highlighting here the secondary endpoint, IOP reduction greater than 20% without medications, the difference between FACO eye stent 53% at two years and FACO 44% at two years 
was no longer statistically significant. This just highlights the efficacy of cataract surgery alone at decreasing pressure when comparing it to the relative IOP lowering of phaco emulsification plus a minimally invasive implant. The same story can be seen with the SciPass Compass trial, significant IOP lowering with cataract surgery alone. Not to belabor the point, I'll just mention that the same thing occurs with Hydrus, where a significant IOP lowering is seen with cataract surgery. Granted, there is enhanced IOP lowering with the implant combined with cataract surgery, but I think you get the point. Cataract surgery alone can significantly decrease intracular pressure. This study evaluated changes in IOP following cataract surgery in eyes with or without glaucoma. The mean preoperative baseline IOP for all patients was 15.2 millimeters of mercury, which decreased to 14.2 millimeters of mercury at 12 months postoperatively. Cataract surgery was more likely to yield sustained IOP reduction for patients with primary open angle glaucoma or narrow angles or angle closure compared to patients without glaucoma. Those with a higher baseline IOP, a consistent fact across most of these studies, were more likely to achieve sustained postoperative IOP reduction. They concluded that patients with primary open angle glaucoma or narrow angles chronic angle closure were more likely to achieve sustained IOP reduction after cataract surgery. Patients with higher baseline IOP had increasingly higher odds of achieving reduction in IOP. This is a more recent study looking at intraocular pressure reduction after real-world cataract surgery. Of note here is the number of eyes that they looked at, 20,508 without glaucoma and 2,251 eyes with glaucoma. They excluded eyes with an axial length under 22 and over 26.5, and preoperative IOP under 6 and over 30 was also excluded. Eyes without glaucoma were noted to have an IOP reduction of 1.4 millimeters of mercury, Eyes with glaucoma were noted to have an IOP reduction of 1.03 millimeters of mercury. They concluded that phaco emulsification alone yields only a modest reduction of IOP in eyes with glaucoma. One more study here looking at intraocular pressure reduction after phaco emulsification, a matched cohort study. This was a retrospective cohort study of patients with glaucoma who underwent phaco emulsification and were matched to patients who did not undergo phaco emulsification on age, gender, type of glaucoma, baseline IOP, and number and type of glaucoma medications. Change in IOP, change in number of glaucoma medications, and likelihood of a glaucoma procedure within 36 months after phaco emulsification were investigated with data available over 36 months. The difference was greater at the one to 18 month time point. IOP increased by 0.22 millimeters of mercury from 16.49 millimeters of mercury in the average non-surgical patient IOP decreased by 0.99 millimeters of mercury from 16.5 millimeters of mercury in the average surgical patient. The differences were greater in ocular hypertension patients and patients with preoperative IOP greater than or equal to 20. The odds ratio of glaucoma surgery were elevated in surgical patients with primary open angle glaucoma. They concluded that surgeons should expect to reduce intraocular pressure approximately 1 to 2 millimeters of mercury with phaco emulsification in patients with preoperative IOP less than 20 millimeters of mercury. This study looked at combined surgery versus cataract surgery alone for eyes with cataract and glaucoma in a Cochrane database review. And what they found was that the mean change in IOP at one year after surgery ranged across cataract surgery alone groups from 5.8 millimeters of mercury to 1 millimeter of mercury lower. The mean change in IOP at one year after surgery in the combined surgery group was on average 1.62 millimeters of mercury lower than the cataract surgery alone group. Just one note of caution, patients with low preoperative IOP may have higher IOPs after uncomplicated cataract surgery. Holly and colleague noted that in the preoperative IOP range of 15 to 17, 55% had lower IOP, 30% had higher IOP, 15% had no change. If IOP was under 15 millimeters of mercury, 55% of patients had a higher IOP postoperatively. In the group of post-trabeculectomy patients, IOP may increase by around 2 millimeters of mercury on average postoperatively. 30 to 50% of patients may require additional medications after surgery. This is just to say that cataract surgery alone may not decrease pressure in all patients, and in fact, in a small group of patients might have a real, albeit small, increase in intraocular pressure.
Going back to our case, this is a 62-year-old male with 12-year history of primary open-angle glaucoma treated bilaterally with latanoprost and dorzolamide. Pressure was 18 and 16 with a goal pressure of 16 in both eyes. Visual field deficit was stable over three to four years, and the patient had visually significant cataracts in both eyes with open angles. He admitted to forgetting use of his medications, and the question at the start of this talk was, what will be your next step? Not surprisingly, in this case, we chose cataract surgery alone, which decreased pressure to 14 in both eyes off of all medications. And it's something for you to consider when you see patients who fit this description. What do I do in my practice? In glaucoma suspect and ocular hypertension patients, I choose FACO alone. In glaucoma, controlled on one to three medications, I perform FACO plus an angle procedure, mainly to decrease dependence on medications. Glaucoma with uncontrolled IOP on one to three medications, that's an easier choice. FACO emulsification with an angle procedure, sometimes combined with endocyclophotocoagulation to target both inflow and outflow of aqueous humor. With angle closure glaucoma, again, a very easy decision to perform angle procedures. In this case, goniotomy is the treatment of choice in my hands, and we've seen dramatic decreases in intraocular pressure in this patient category. In most cases, trabs and tubes are reserved for pseudofakes who fail the above treatment algorithm. What does evidence-based medicine teach us? FACO alone as an IOP lowering procedure should be considered in all patients with glaucoma and visually significant cataracts. FACO alone is a viable first-line surgical option for narrow-angle glaucoma. FACO alone is also a viable option for controlled glaucoma on one to two medications. You may improve vision, and you have a good chance of getting off of one drop. In the setting of uncontrolled glaucoma with open angles, cataract extraction alone is still evolving from an evidence-based medicine standpoint. The patient and the surgeon must discuss all options and decide on the best possible course of action. And in some cases, a sequential surgical plan can take place with evaluation of the intraocular pressure lowering after each step is taken. In many cases, the art of medicine matters just as much as the science, and that is certainly the case when weighing the options of cataract surgery alone versus cataract surgery combined with a glaucoma procedure in patients across the continuum of glaucoma severity. Please consider visiting keogt.com for further educational material, and you can follow this lecture as well as several other lectures at the YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram channels you see listed on this slide. Thank you for your time.